In this video, we are going to talk about the second derivative test. So I've shown that the explanation of that test here at the top. We are going to suppose that f is a function and you have your first derivative and your second derivative and that they both exist on an interval and that the um, the first derivative evaluated at your critical value that they're going to call c is equal to zero. So if you take that critical value and you plug it into your second derivative, what we know is that when that second derivative is greater than zero, that's going to tell us that you have a local minimum. And if the second derivative is less than zero, that's going to tell us that we have a local maximum. So remember with second derivatives, that when we have positive values, we think of concave up. And so that's why this would produce a minimum. Whereas with when the second derivative is negative, we think of the graph as being concave down, which is why we would have an actual maximum. Now, if your second derivative evaluated at your critical value is equal to zero, then we just say the test fails. So we're going to consider this function and we're going to use the second derivative test to find our local extrema if the test applies. So we first have to find a first derivative. So I'll do that right here. So the first derivative of this polynomial would become 20x minus 20. And then we have to find a second derivative. And so the second derivative of this function is 20. Now remember your critical values, they come from setting your first derivative equal to zero. So if I come back up here, my first derivative was 20x minus 20. I set that equal to zero and I'll solve for x. So if 20x is equal to 20 and we divide both sides by 20, then I have a critical value of one. Now what happens when we take that critical value and we plug it in to the second derivative is we have an answer of positive 20. So if there's nowhere to plug it into the function, that is your second derivative. Notice that is positive. So if that's positive, that tells us that we have an actual local minimum with an x value of 1. Now, when they ask you for the local minima, they want both an x and a y value. So if we know the x is 1, we would need to go back to the original function to find the y value. So if I come back to my original function and plug in my x value of 1, 10 times 1 squared minus 20 times 1 minus 240. And so 1 squared would be 1 times 10 is 10 minus 20 times 1 is 20 minus 240. So 10 minus 20 is negative 10 minus 240 would leave me with a negative 250. So the y value of that point is negative 250. Since my second derivative is not going to be negative, then what that means is I do not have a local maxima. So I would choose that answer there. Okay, so here's a second problem. And You've got to remember your rules of derivatives here. So I brought in one with a chain rule. And so once again, we start with a first derivative. So remember with chain rule, we're going to pull the power to the front, leave the parentheses as it is, decrease the power by one, but then multiply by the derivative of the function inside the parentheses. So that would be multiplied by a 6x. And so if we actually simplify that, 2 times 6x would give me a 12x times a 3x squared plus 16 to the first. And actually we can simplify, well, really no need to simplify that any further because you're going to want to find critical values anyway. And so we find critical values by setting that equal to zero. So now I'm going to say that 12x times 3x squared plus 16 is equal to zero. And since that's already in a factored form, I'll just set each factor equal to zero. So if 12x is equal to zero and I solve, then one of my critical values is actually zero. And then if I take the other factor, 3x squared plus 16 and set it equal to zero, when I subtract 16 on both sides, I get 3x squared is negative 16. 
divide both sides by 3, and you're getting that x squared is a negative number. Now, we know that when we try to get x by itself and take the square root of a negative number, it produces imaginary. So we don't need to go any further because we're not going to consider imaginary numbers as critical values. So the only critical value there is the x equals 0. And I guess I kind of got ahead of myself because we need that down here. The first step just said to find the second derivative. So actually, let me come back. And so we had our first derivative right here. And if I had to actually find a second derivative, then what I would do is I would go ahead and distribute that before so that all I have to do then is use the power rule. So we're going to say the first derivative is 12x times 3x squared would be 36x cubed. And then plus, if I take my 12, let's see, I'm grabbing a calculator real quick, 12 times 16 is 192 times x. And so I would do that before I would take a second derivative. Now, taking a second derivative, using my just power rules in this case, 36 times 3 would give me 108, and then that would become x squared and then plus the derivative of 192x is just 192. So that's the part one. And then using that derivative for part two and using the fact that we have a critical value of zero, if we come down here and we plug zero into my second derivative, then I have 108 times zero squared plus 192. So 0 squared is 0 times 108 is 0. So notice I get a positive value, which would be 192. So when that second derivative is positive, that's an indication that we have a local minimum. We still need to find its y value. And, and in this case, since that was the only critical value, once again, we do not have a local maxima. So my final step here will be to find the y value that goes with this x value of 0. And again, that goes back to the original because we're looking for the y value on the graph. So my y value is going to be 3 times 0 squared plus 16 squared. So 3 times, so 0 squared is 0 times 3 is still 0. And when you add 0 plus 16, and then you square it, you get 256. So the local minimum would be at the point 0, 0,256.